In the previous lesson, we covered the fundamentals of damping. Let's shift now to apply the concepts via two distinct examples. Our first example is that of a circuit board in a cabinet enclosure. The example simulation model we would use is a simplified circuit board in a generic cabinet enclosure. It's not meant to replicate any particular design. Circuit boards are used extensively in so many applications, from our cars, to our computers, to our phones, and beyond. Here we have a printed circuit board, also known as a PCB for short, on top of a car engine block. You can imagine, with the engine running, the vibration of the engine will transmit into the PCB. How much vibration would be experienced by the components on the board? How much will they displace, or even how much stress will be produced at their connections, which are often critical for reliability? The simulation of this vibration problem typically requires a forced frequency response analysis with the proper damping specified. To illustrate this, let's look at a simple case of the PCB inside a simple enclosure, much like you would find with a desktop computer. Now imagine this enclosure is attached to or next to some machinery that's operating and inducing vibration. Let's assume the vibration input is a uniform displacement of 0.5 millimeter amplitude at the base of the enclosure, and this excitation takes place over a specified frequency range. What we wish to understand is what is the effect of the damping on the deformation of the board. If we look at the corner of this heatsink, we can compare the displacement for two different specifications of the damping ratio. In the first case, we set the damping ratio to zero. Now, such a case is extreme as all structures at least have some amount of damping, but it does help to make the point, in contrast, having with some higher damping values. The simulation computes an extreme displacement value that could never be experienced physically, but this is a byproduct of the linear dynamics equations and the underlying assumptions. In fact, a hand calculation of a forced harmonic response of a zero damp system would also show infinite response at resonance. But now have a look when we specify a more realistic damping ratio of 0.025 or 2.5%. Notice that the amplitude of the heat sink displacement shows 11.3 millimeters at the peak. What is happening is the enclosure with the PCB is excited at one of its natural frequencies, so we expect some resonance. So in this case, that seemingly benign 0.5 millimeters applied displacement is getting amplified to 11.3 millimeters, which is something we typically wish to avoid. But we can also see that damping is preventing excessive deformation compared to the zero damping case. These peaks in our frequency response plot correspond with the natural frequencies of our system. In this case, that large peak occurs at 108 hertz or 108 cycles per second. So harmonic analysis or sine sweep shaker table testing is often performed physically on structures to determine and verify the damping characteristics as well as the natural frequencies of the structure. Now our second example is related to the suspension system of a car. A car suspension is one of the most common mechanical systems in the world where damping is critical. While we may take this system for granted, it's almost always there smoothing out the ride for the passengers. In this example, we will actually use a suspension system of a model car but the same physics applies to a full-size automotive suspension system. Now recall from our prior discussion that the total damping in the system may come from several sources. Let's focus on two dominant sources in the car suspension system, the viscous damping from the shock absorber and the material damping in the rubber of the tire. For this simulation example, we focus on just the suspension portion of one wheel and the mass of the car is accounted for via an idealized point mass, even though the rest of the car is not seen. A rigid block is used to simulate a bump in the road by thrusting the block up and down over a short time duration. The suspension then reacts to the bump, and we will look at the response of the system. For the shock absorber, we can directly specify the damping coefficient C, as well as the spring stiffness K. The value of these could be measured and specified in the simulation. Now for the damping of the tire material, we make the assumption that the damping ratio is 0.05 or 5%. Recall that damping of rubbers is often temperature and frequency dependent, but for this example, we assume it is just constant. 
We also recall the equation that we discussed during the Raleigh damping relating the damping ratio to the alpha and beta multipliers. Let's assume the mass damping alpha is zero, which can be a common assumption. We can now easily compute beta if we know omega. But what do we specify for omega? If we run a simulation of our shock absorber before specifying the material damping of the rubber, we can determine the dominant frequency of the vibration. The time history of the stresses in the tire reveals that during the impact of the tire with the bump, there is some initial high frequency response, but then the tire experiences a dominant vibration frequency of about 5 Hz, or the period of oscillation is about 0.2 seconds. We compute omega, then substituting it in along with the damping ratio, we compute beta to be about 3.2 e to the minus 3, and we specify this for the tire material. Let's now compare the results. Here we have two different values of the shock absorber damping, C of 0.1 and 0.5. The simulation using 0.1 is underdamped, and notice from the blue curve how the vibration takes a long time to decay and may need back and forth oscillations. This would make for an uncomfortable ride with all the bouncing. You can clearly see this in the animation, but with five times the damping, we can see from the orange curve the rapid decay of the vibration. Also, Notice how quickly the suspension system absorbs the shock and stabilizes.